Bitcoin uh, in in really less than a month has dropped twenty uh, percent uh, from its peak in February at twenty five thousand to uh, a little bit below twenty thousand now. Now I want to end this call on cryptocurrencies because um, I was on CNBC with uh, Brian Sullivan on his new show. Uh, I think it's called Last Call on CNBC yesterday and Silicon Valley Bank was breaking and, you know, I wasn't even supposed to be talking about that. I was supposed to be talking about innovation. Uh, But uh, I think Brian brought the topic down to, see, crypto dominoes still falling, still falling, Um, uh, hearkening back to Luna Terra last year and FTX and 3AC and Celsius and all of the implosions. And what I said to him is, if you think about it, first of all, just think about crypto. Um, The Bitcoin blockchain and Ethereum, those two blockchains have not skipped a beat. Uh, There have been no transactions interrupted. The smart contracts, which are rules-based, uh, when there's a margin call, uh, a stock goes down or, or, so, or something uh, drops in value, there's an automatic margin call. It just happens automatically in this over-collateralized system. Uh, I think what we're seeing today is in some of these banks, under-collateralization. But in both cases, what, what do we have going on? These are centralized entities. Uh, and they're not transparent. Certainly when it came to FTX, not at all transparent. Uh, Centralized, opaque, completely opaque. The banks have to do more disclosure, so they're not as opaque. Um, And, uh, you know, you you could see that they were upside down in terms of interest rates, having to pay up for deposits, but earning a very low-yield to which they committed at a bad time when interest rates were very low, thinking they were being smart. Um, and so this is nothing to do with crypto. In fact, Silicon Valley Bank, I mean, I don't think you're good to see a mention of uh, crypto at all there. Uh, so it has nothing to do with crypto, but it does have something to do with what happens during banking crisis. Usually these banks are upside down. They start losing deposits Uh, In the case of Silvergate and uh, Silicon Valley Bank, there's a run on the bank. When you get Peter Thiel and other uh, famous investors and well-respected investors saying, get your money out of there, they're going to take the money and run. And uh, so this is nothing to do with crypto. This has everything to do with Fed policy, we believe, uh, taking interest rates up so dramatically Uh, the most rapid rate in history, and taking money growth down from 27% two years ago to minus three. So that's a 30 percentage point swing that has never happened. We've gone back to the Great Depression to see if that was the case back then as well. It wasn't. And so I think we're going to see more ramifications, but each one of these is a reminder to the Fed and I think the Fed is the Fed's rhetoric is going to change uh, pretty dramatically during during the next three to six months. Contrarian investor and Ark Invest CEO Kathy Wood in her latest in the note update unpacks the current banking crisis going on and what is going to all mean for markets. For those that haven't seen over the weekend, several United States banks, including Silvergate and Silicon Valley Bank, failed due to poor asset allocation and rising interest rates leading to runs on the bank. This caused a crypto market sell-off, prompting President Joe Biden to hold an emergency meeting and announce a Federal Reserve guarantee of customers' deposits in these failed banks. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video where Kathy breaks down what this crisis means for risk assets such as Bitcoin, Ethereum and crypto and why she believes that now is the time to be getting into these assets. Also, only a small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed. If you enjoy finance content, consider subscribing or liking the video. It's free and you can always change your mind. March in March, the month of March, uh, especially around this time, specifically this week, uh, the market tends to go through cathartic moments. 
either um, either coming out of a bear market or uh, perhaps relapsing into a bear market. And um, uh, here we are again. And often the trigger is uh, something financial, something in the banking system. So here we are again. And um, I think this time, just to cut to the quick here, uh, I, I do believe that uh, with the, the banking failures that we are seeing, Silvergate Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, and there may be a few more regionals, but we do not think this is a systemic uh, uh, banking problem. Uh, we do think it will cause a different kind of conversation at the Fed. Uh, you know, we've been talking for a while uh, about monetary policy and signals that it uh, uh, that monetary policy had gone too far in terms of tightening. Uh, and I do think bank failures uh, are a, a wake up call very often for for policymakers generally and the Fed specifically. Uh, so we think that's going to be the case this time as well. But we're beginning to see uh, brewing here a banking crisis. Uh, and the question we have to answer, is this going to become systemic like Lehman Brothers in 08 or 09? Or, and we're betting on this latter one here, is this more like 1994 when uh, Orange County went broke, and that created a crisis to which the Fed responded. Uh, we think it's much more like 1994 because the setup was similar. Uh, in 93-94, commodity prices had taken off as we were coming out of that uh, recession. It was an SNL induced recession, so housing. And and uh, the Fed was railing against those price increases with higher interest rates. It was a terrible year for growth stocks. And that's how we would characterize uh, 2022. Um, but when Orange County went bust, uh, that was a sign that the Fed had gone too far. And uh, the Fed did change its spots. We believe that the failure of uh, Silvergate Bank and Silicon Valley Bank, that, which just uh, uh, went, the FDIC put it into receivership today, uh, both of those are telling us a couple of things. One that, yeah, the Fed has gone uh, pretty far and is causing a lot of banks, not just these, um, um, difficulties, and I'll describe uh, how in a moment. Uh, so we do agree with those who say, well, Silvergate had a concentration of crypto clients, customers, and Silicon Valley Bank had a, a high concentration of venture and venture-related uh, customers. Uh, and so that's all true. But if you look at what has happened here. It is the deposit outflows that have triggered the, the, the problem, the crisis. Uh, we know that venture capital um, has is facing a bit of a liquidity squeeze. Uh, fewer deals are being done. There is more risk aversion in the marketplace. And uh, so these companies are having to draw down their deposits uh, they most bank with Sil Silicon Valley Bank. They're drawing down their deposits because they have to. And there are others perhaps at Silicon uh, Valley Bank who are saying, uh, wait a minute, I'm not being paid anything here at this bank or not paid very much. So I'm just going to put my money in a money market fund and, until I need it. Um, a lot of banks are facing that latter risk. If you look at the money center banks, the big banks, uh, they hardly pay anything on deposits, uh, and um, and uh, and so uh, money is fleeing to money market funds. Now that's not going to present a difficulty for the big money center banks. They are extremely well diversified. Uh, most of them have nothing to do uh, with uh, venture, or or if if they do, it's uh, it, it doesn't represent. Uh, uh, a big percentage of their business. 
Uh, but there are smaller banks out there that uh, that are facing some issues. And I'll just say one more thing about the large banks. Because of what happened in 08, 09, uh, they have been forced by regulators um, into capital ratios, which uh, suggest that today they are uh, extremely well capitalized and uh, they're, they're like Fort Knox, so very safe. So this is no Lehman moment. However, there are uh, small regional banks out there who uh, were not subject to the same kind of capital ratios. And uh, they therefore have been taking business that used to go to the uh, large money center banks perhaps disproportionately, and uh, moving more into um, funding venture companies, uh, or uh, they've been moving into commercial real estate. Historically, they've had a big position in residential real estate, as you might imagine. Local banks know, know their local customers, and so real estate, uh, residential real estate. But now, uh, on average, uh, 25% of their loan book is in uh, commercial real estate. And we're, what we have to watch here is, is the office part of commercial real estate. Um, offices are empty now. There's been a lot of building on, uh, going on, or, and uh, those new buildings are getting uh, all of the attention and uh, the older buildings are, are really uh, the vacancy rates are quite high. Uh, so we are seeing we are seeing what what is called strategic d defaults, um, and what that means is uh, that the borrowers are going back to the lenders, like these regional banks, and saying, uh, you know, our vacancy rates have gone up. Um, we can't, uh, our cash flows aren't there. We got to renegotiate this loan. So we think there are going to be a lot of renegotiations uh, and uh, it will halt a lot of activity. Uh, and uh, I do think that it will get into the economic statistics. So I just want to make sure you understand we do not believe this is a Lehman like moment. But we do believe there are some banking issues out there, and certainly the bank, uh, the bank indexes uh, in the stock market. Uh, if you if you look at them, um, you will find the regional banks have been dis disproportionately hit in here. Uh, the money center banks haven't been doing that well, uh, but they're kind of steady state. Uh, so the market is making that distinction. So. Just a little bit more of what has happened here. During 2020, when we were going through COVID, um, there was a huge amount of stimulus, as you, as you will all remember. And uh, many banks had incredible inflows, deposits, uh, and uh, both Silvergate and, uh, and Silicon Valley Bank were two of them. So here we are. Now, what are they going to do? Well, Silvergate really doesn't make loans, didn't make loans. So it bought securities, um, liquid, but long-term uh, oriented securities, fixed income. Uh, and you'll see that uh, Silicon Valley Bank did that as well. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank, which uh, went under uh, took all that money, and uh, I, if I remember, it was in the 70 to $90 billion range, and put it into these long-term instruments to earn a higher yield than in the, in the um, money markets. At that time, money markets were paying maybe 0.5%, and they got 1.6% on average on that money. Now, the assumption they were making is that interest rates were not going to go anywhere anytime soon. And of course, that it has proven to be wrong. Uh, interest rates, as I've mentioned on the, this webinar many times, have gone up, I think it's 20 fold in less than a year's time. Uh, that has never happened before. 
Uh, and I hearken back to uh, 1981, when Volcker was trying to squeeze inflation out of the system, he took interest rates up twofold, from 10% to 20%. True, a high level. But the shock, already people had gotten used to interest rates going up, so they were, they were preparing for it. Uh, so the shock from going from 10 to 20, there was some shock value, but nothing like we're seeing now. Uh, and here are some of the ramifications. Now, many people in comparing to 1981, uh, they, they say, well, the yield curve is the same as it was back then. Uh, and, and my answer to that is a, an inverted yield curve of 100 basis points when long-term treasury yields are 4% or less, that's like a 25% uh, inversion if you're trying to measure it, get a sense of uh, sizing it relative to 1981. So uh, 100 basis points over 4%, one over four, 25%. If you go back to 1981, that 100 basis point inversion was against 15% interest rates. So that's more like six to seven percent. So I would submit that this is four, this is sending four times the signal that that inverted yield curve sent in uh, in the early 80s. And I think we're beginning to see some of the ramifications. Um, what the, the, the problem for Silicon Valley Bank, which was considered a, a very fine bank, had you know, a t an a amazing reputa reputation. Yes, it had customer concentration. And yes, it probably started making bad decisions, uh, just helping um, GPs, uh, general partners of venture capital funds, uh, fund this, that, and the other without really uh, studying, thinking, uh, thinking and assuming that venture would go on forever. We haven't had down rounds in quite a while and uh, it would go on forever. Well, that also was an incorrect assumption. Uh, so what happened, deposits left and it was forced to sell securities, which it was holding at a loss. Uh, and these are held uh, to maturity securities, uh, which those losses don't really show up unless they're realized. And so they had no choice but to turn to um, uh, both all, all of the securities that were available for sale. They sold those at a loss, I think a $1.8 billion loss. They tried to do an offering to fill that hole, an equity offering of $2 billion, and the market absolutely rejected it. And, and that's when we knew, oh my gosh, they're gonna be forced into selling these held to maturity securities uh, because they're upside down. Uh, in order to d attract deposits, um, they, they would have to uh, increase interest rates dramatically. And even then, because they're so focused on the venture uh, capital community, which is actually calling capital, those, uh, those deposits were being drawn down uh, because these companies uh, haven't been able to do new rounds and uh, and they many lose money. Uh, and so they were uh, forced to take down deposits. Uh, so it was in a, a, a very bad way. Um, I think the, the mark to market losses were 15 billion and its equity position was only 12 billion. So effectively it was insolvent having to recognize those losses. Uh, and so here we are. Um, so again, I'm just making, explaining what happened. There are some other regional banks, we think, in a similar position. Uh, maybe they've catered a little bit too much to the VC community. Uh, maybe they are uh, in the middle of negotiating uh, uh, for, for, uh, on uh, non-commercial loans, office buildings and uh, are having to mark those down as well, or the market is seeing that that could be the case. Uh, so just wanted to explain that a bit. Now, the other thing that I've been really focused on, and it is an esoteric con uh, concept, and, uh, or topic, I should say, um, 
and I have mentioned it before, but it is at this time that, that it's very important. If money growth on a year over year basis is negative, um, uh, there is an equation out there in economics called MV equals PQ. Money times velocity equals price times volume. Um, now if money and, and price times volume is GDP, uh, nominal GDP. So what is, if money is going down, what is keeping nominal GDP from going down? It is an acceleration in the turnover of money. And that usually happens in risk on situations where confidence is very high. Um, and, and it sometimes happens out of necessity, which has happened uh, very recently. Um, now, the concern here is that this banking crisis, I would call it a mini, mini crisis, is because of muscle memory associated with the, the crisis in 08, 09, is going to, um, is going to cause uh, individuals and corporations to slow things down a bit, not take that extra risk, make sure they have a big enough capital cushion. Uh, and then there's another thing that might be causing that. Uh, the student loan moratorium, it, it looks like it will end in June. So in July or August, uh, the consumers that have been enjoying that moratorium will have to turn around and start repaying, uh, repaying those loans. Uh, in preparation for that, they might be uh, slowing down purchases. Uh, so uh, that this idea, money going down, if, if velocity also goes down, so the rate at which money turns over because people are becoming more cautious, uh, want to build their cash cushions, um, if that happens, then we have a severe recession. That I've been saying recently, how could we have a severe recession if housing is already down 40% by some measures. In fact, it's interesting to note that existing home sales are at 4 million units at an annual rate. As of the last reading, when I started in the business, 1977, I was in college, existing home sales were 5 million back then. And the population's much larger today. So that's really saying something about where housing is. Autos are also down, not, not as much as they were, but if we get this cautious behavior, they will come down and consumption generally will come down. And that's how, actually that's the only way we can have a severe recession because we've been through rolling recessions in the, in the last year. So um, just wanted to explain that. And I hope that gets more discussion at the Fed as well. It's important. Uh, Bitcoin uh, in, in really less than a month has dropped 20% uh, 20, 20 uh, from its peak in February at 25,000 to uh, a little bit below 20,000 now. Now, I want to end this call on cryptocurrencies because um, I was on CNBC with uh, Brian Sullivan on his new show, uh, I think it's called Last Call on CNBC yesterday and Silicon Valley Bank was breaking and, you know, I wasn't even supposed to be talking about that. I was supposed to be talking about innovation. Uh, but uh, I think Brian brought the topic down to, see, crypto dominoes still falling, still falling, um, uh, hearkening back to Luna Terra last year and FTX and 3AC and Celsius and all of the implosions. And what I said to him is, if you think about it, first of all, just think about crypto. Um, the Bitcoin blockchain and Ethereum, those two blockchains have not skipped a beat. Uh, there have been no transactions interrupted. The smart contracts, which are rules-based, uh, when there's a margin call, uh, a stock goes down or, or, so, or something uh, drops in value, there's an automatic margin call. It just happens automatically in this over-collateralized system. 
uh, I think what we're seeing today is in some of these banks under collateralization. But in both cases, what, what do we have going on? These are centralized entities uh, and they're not transparent. Certainly when it came to FTX, not at all transparent. Uh, centralized, opaque, completely opaque. The banks have to do more disclosure, so they're not as opaque. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you could see that they were upside down in terms of interest rates, having to pay up for deposits, but earning a very low yield to which they committed at a bad time when interest rates were very low, thinking they were being smart. Um, and so this is nothing to do with crypto. In fact, Silicon Valley Bank, I mean, I don't think you're good to see a mention of uh, crypto at all there. Uh, so it has nothing to do with crypto, but it does have something to do with what happens during banking crisis. Usually these banks are upside down. They start losing deposits. Uh, in the case of Silvergate and uh, Silicon Valley Bank, there's a run on the bank. When you get Peter Thiel and other uh, famous investors and well-respected investors saying, get your money out of there, they're going to take the money and run. And uh, so this is nothing to do with crypto. This has everything to do with Fed policy, we believe, uh, taking interest rates up so dramatically, uh, the most rapid rate in history and taking money growth down from 27% two years ago to minus three. So that's a 30 percentage point swing that has never happened. We've gone back to the Great Depression to see if that was the case back then as well. It wasn't. And so I think we're going to see more ramifications, but each one of these is a reminder to the Fed. And I think the Fed is, the Fed's rhetoric is going to change. Uh, pretty dramatically during during the next three to six months. Uh, so hopefully the market began to see this and expect it, meaning the other side of the interest rate move to the upside. Uh, the market in, in the equity market in January uh, began to anticipate that the Fed was going to lower the rate at which it was increasing rates, which, which was true, it did, 25 basis points. And this crisis, I think, was caused by hawkish uh, talk from Chairman Powell this week, suggesting, wait a minute, are we going back to up 50 basis points? And uh, I think that's uh, caused uh, uh, basically a run in some banks but very specific banks with co customer concentration or loan concentration uh, with a particular group of, uh, uh, of entities. Uh, so it seems like crypto has been blamed for everything uh, since last year, but actually that what has happened with the Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum blockchains is they serve as proof of concept. They have not stopped. Transactions that were supposed to take place are taking place seamlessly. And, uh, you know, the health of the network is still very strong. Short term signals, uh, on chain signals uh, might have turned a big bit negative because crypto is not immune from liquidity pressures generally in, uh, in the traditional world. Uh, but this idea of decentralized and transparent, uh, which we believe is going to support digital wallets, um, it has just gotten more of a proof of concept. More centralized entities are going under. They don't skip a beat. And we do believe that uh, the financial system is going to evolve more towards digital wallets, um, uh, which uh, are involved in decentralized and transparent networks uh, that are going to maintain their health. Uh, it's the, the transparency is, is the reason uh, they are remaining healthy. So with that thought, I will leave.